Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Isabella Tabarovsky, and I'm a senior program associate at the Wilson Center's Canon Institute. Thank you all for joining us for today's conversation, transmitting the memory of Stalin's repressions to Russia's next generation. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you to stay up to date with upcoming events and publications on our website, as well as on our web, uh, as well as our podcasts, Canon X, and our newest podcast, The Russia File. You can find our latest analysis of events in the region on our Russia File and Focus Ukraine blogs. And in addition, please check out the latest Wilson Quarterly, which just came out last week. This issue is titled The Ends of History, and it examines how historical memory shapes politics and culture in many centers of the globe, including Russia, China, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Belgium, Mexico, and the nations of the former Yugoslavia. And with some shameless self-promotion here, I'll say that I have a piece on that issue which discusses how Russia remembers and doesn't remember the Second World War, including Stalin's repressions, the topic of our conversation today. The piece is called Russia's Lost War. Throughout the program, if you have questions for our guests, you can submit them via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions. So without further ado, we are going to begin our conversation today and we're going to start with remarks from Katya Patin. Katya is a multimedia editor for Coda Story and multimedia journalist based in Belize, Georgia. Her work focuses on disinformation and authoritarian technology. She's also the series producer of Generation Gulag. It's a series that consists of 11 mini documentaries, very short videos, one of which we will see today, which uncovers the impact of Russia's campaign to rewrite the history of the Gulag and includes interviews with the survivors of the Gulag. Katya is also the series producer of Jailed for a Like, which, is, uh, which consists of six films telling the stories of Russians who have been prosecuted or imprisoned for their social media posts, shares, or likes. This series was shortlisted for the European Press Prize in 2018. Katya's work has appeared in The Guardian, in NBC, The Atlantic, and other publications. Katya, please, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you, Isabella, and hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. It's great to be here with Nikolai and Grigori. I'm, I'm really glad we're having discussion like this and able to tie it, um, tie it around the Memorial Day that's tomorrow to victims of, of Soviet repression. Um, I also think it's a it's great and it's a nice chance to be able to show a short uh, it's going to be an abridged version of one of the episodes from Generation Gulag and I, I think it is a sort of a nice way to start it's a nice idea you had Isabella to to begin with with a real story to see uh, um, to hear from a, a Gulag survivor and to sort of ground our discussion today so that it's you know grounded in the present and and not in the past. Um, but before I show the film, I wanna give sort of a short summary of, of my work and talk a bit about the reporting experience for Generation Gulag, um, which was a series of 11 films and it was published by Coda Story, both in English and in Russian earlier this year in January. And then throughout the year, we've been part, uh, publishing through a series of partners, uh, mostly at Radio for Europe, so these films have gone out in, in Kazakh and Romanian and Ukrainian and a number of, of different languages. So I think um, I'd like to go through sort of the, the three main goals that I had when we, we started out with Generation Gulag. And the, the first one is really especially topical for our discussion today. Um, the sort of the primary goal that I had for the series was, was to find a way to transmit these stories from the past and to transmit them to the present to a younger audience and to make this uh, a series about something that's happening today not something that happened a long time ago and so what, what was really key to that strategy was using animation and you'll see in the film that I show that there are lots of animated scenes and that was you know it was a strategy to try to find a way to bring use art to bring these stories out of the past um, but it, it, wasn't also, it wasn't just a strategy, it also kind of came out of this necessity. Um, at the outset of our production process, it just really became so clear to our production team that there are just so few photos and videos available um, from that time period for, of the Gulag and that just this visual library of the repressions of these events is, is so lacking. 
Um, and I'm not just talking about the 1930s, I'm talking the repressions and Soviet repressions as a whole. So nearly seven decades, right? Um, most, of the, most of the visuals that the multimedia material we were able to find their government propaganda films about the gulag or photos taken by state officials. That's, that's pretty much it. And while you know, this may seem very obvious to some people here, it's, I think it's absolutely just a, a key challenge. It's a huge challenge for how to tell this history, how to tell these stories, um, how to make them relevant today. And it became even more clear to me when we started working with a group of artists and animators on the project. And it was a really young team, the creative team, almost nearly everyone was under the age of 30, if not under the age of 25. Um, the requests I kept getting over and over from artists was, can you, can you send us a reference of, you know, what would barracks look like um, in a women's prison in Mardovia in the 1950s? Uh, would, were people in the 60s wearing uniforms or what would people be wearing in the 40s? And, you know, I kept getting this request over and over and the answer is there hardly, there hardly any, there's hardly anything to send them. And it became, I think kind of the best example is the episode we had about the massacre in Novichokovsk in the 1960s. And the woman we spoke to, Valentina, um, even during the interview, she talks about being at the protest, looking up and seeing a helicopter constantly uh, going over the crowd with a film crew in the helicopter. So she knew she was being filmed. She knew she was being photographed. And, and she thinks this is you know, how she was later identified, um, charged and, and sent to a camp for five years. So the artist that, that I was working with, she's a university student in Moscow. She was writing to me that, Kasia, uh, I can't find this film anywhere. I can't find photos from these protests. Uh, where, you know, where am I not searching for it correctly? Where, where can I find this? Um, and I, I don't know where the film is. Maybe it was destroyed, maybe it was lost, but it's also just as possible that, you know, as we're here today, it's sitting somewhere in a dusty warehouse under lock and key by the Russian authorities, by the FSB who are refusing to make these archives open to the public. Um, and just with so many of these, uh, so many of these major events of the 20th century, whether it's the Great Depression or the Holocaust or the civil rights movement in the US, uh, when, you, when you hear these events, you immediately have images kind of flash in your, in your head. And, you know, I think that that is really key and that in order to keep historical memory alive, you have to keep the visual memory alive as well. Um, and that for me is really one of the strongest signs of the Kremlin's, monop the Kremlin's monopoly today on these dark chapters of its history. And it's this insistence on keeping the archives closed, which for documentary filmmakers, for journalists, for any storytellers, it, it makes it you know, very difficult to find a way to tell these stories. Um, so then the, the second point, the second kind of central goal I had with Generation Gulag, I wanna tell you a bit about where, where we started off with the project from the very, very beginning. Um, our initial idea was quite different than what we ended up with uh, because initially the plan was to go to the archives that are open, which is in the Baltic States, in Georgia, for example, and to try to dig up these documents, find incredible sort of untold stories to animate them and to bring them to life. But in, in discussing this idea, we realized um, that it's incredibly obvious that this is a perfect project to do in 10 years time or in 15 years time. But today there are still tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who, who have firsthand memory of these events and that the priority right now is really of course to to go to them and to to try to talk to them and for me for me that really ended up being I think it, it ended up being the sort of biggest myth that I wanted Generation Gulag to uh, to address and I think again it's something really key that helps us understand how the Russian authorities today how do they approach talking about Soviet terror because absolutely you know there, there is public acknowledgement of the horrors of the past. 
Um, there are memorials and, and you know, it's not a closed topic the same way it was decades ago, but it's a discussion that's, it's really fixated on the 1930s or on Stalin. Um, it's fixated on presenting Soviet repression as something that is, you know, a very dark, scary time that happened long ago. Um, but what you won't hear Russian authorities say, or at least say very often, is that sort of political terror, the system of the gulag camps, the deportations, just all of the repressions, that they're really part of the DNA of the Soviet Union for so many years. And so again, to sort of bring this back to the younger generation, I, I really think that's why so many young people today in Russia have a hard time connecting these events, connecting to these events. The you know, Soviet repressions are, are presented as if they're basically ancient history, right? Um, so, so in our series, the earliest story that we, um, that we were able to tell is from the 1930s. It's the video that I'll show in a couple minutes. Um, and we go through the 1960s. And I wish, you know, we, we could have continued. We could have gone into the 70s and the 80s. Our, our, just, our priority was to try to catch those people who are in their 80s, who are in their 90s, this generation who is now slipping away. Um, and even during the filming, during the pr production process, we had several people that we were, um, in one case, we were gonna film a man the following day and he died the evening before. And this was not the only case. And we really felt like we were just grasping, you know, onto these last, you know, remaining stories that were about to disappear. Um, and then the, so the last point I'll, I'll make quickly before, uh, before showing the film is I want to explain sort of the bigger picture, uh, the bigger context that we had in mind for the series. And sort of when, you know, as a journalist, when pitching a story idea or an idea for a 10 series documentary project, um, any, any good editor, the first question or the, you know, one of the main questions they'll ask you is why now? Why does, why does our audience need to hear the story now? So, you know, for us and for me, if the context for Generation Gulag and, and the stories of the, of the Soviet repressions, you know, they're very much relevant today. When you look at this, um, when you look at the wider, the kind of bigger global picture with rewriting history, you know, Russia, obviously, Russia's not alone here. Um, we're living, we're all living through this time of democratic backsliding, we're seeing this new generation of authoritarian leaders who are, who are using history to nation build, to redefine national identity. And you know, obviously no government is immune to, to instrumentalizing its history. And we've seen that so much this year in 2020 in the US and the UK, in all the discussions around monuments and all these discussions about how governments and people and society, how, how we all deal with our unsavory history. Um, so I, I just, I do think, you know, studying how governments use history in nation building and selectively deploying the past, it, it gives us real sort of meaningful insight into that country and, and, and just what's happening. Um, so I think without further delay, I'll, I'll queue up the um, episode I have prepared. It is, it's in an abridged version. The full version is online. So I do hope you'll you'll go to cordastory.com and uh, get a chance to watch the full episode and the rest of the episodes. Um, and then I look forward to hearing from Grigori and Nikolai in a few moments. Otherwise, I will queue up the episode. Thanks. And over to um, to Azari Plisetsky. Майя знала все, она знала отца, она обожала отца, и это было страшно, его арест. Она какими-то эпизодами вспоминала это. Вспоминала, как пришли забирать отца, как он лежал бледный на тахте, как мама его спрашивала, Миша, ну что происходит, что конец света? Да. Это конец света. В 
Он понимал, что когда его исключили из партии, что арест последует неминуемо. Он видел это кругом. Аресты шли по массовом порядке. Мама дрожащая, там собирала ему вещи. Держала в руках галстук, говорила, а галстук нужен? Вот эта фраза «галстук нужен» мне запомнилась. Действительно, не галстук, а веревка нужна была. Первые воспоминания, очевидно, уже когда мы э, переехали из э, ГУЛАГа, из Алжира в Чемкент. Это было уже не заключение, а ссылка. Мне уже было больше двух лет. Остались у меня в памяти воспоминания о Чемкенте, о этой мазанке, в которой мы жили. Высоченные, высоченные тополя, когда снизу на них смотришь, кажется, что они упираются куда-то в невероятную высь. Наконец, была снята судимость с матери, было получено разрешение вернуться в Москву. Я видел, как после войны к моим друзьям возвращались отцы. Мне говорили, что отец пропал без вести на фронте. Во всяком случае, как-то эта тема скрывалась. Мать сделала запрос, ей прислали справку о реабилитации. Я узнал о смерти отца, я даже не предполагал, что с ним произошло. Все-таки мать до последнего момента, до получения этой справки, она все-таки надеялась, что он вернется. Ну и потом отовсюду появились люди, которые знали отца, вдруг стали навещать мать, которые ее сторонились до этого. Появился один человек, который уговаривал мать не, не, не делать никакие запросы. Потом я узнал, почему. Когда открыли дела, оказывается, этот человек доносил на отца. Когда воссоздалась вся эта картина этих сталинских репрессий в полной мере, когда мы получили хотя бы даже вот тоже возможность ознакомиться с делом отца, с его допросами, с его расстрелом через 15 минут после суда, конечно, преступность, преступность режима вас стала ясной абсолютно. Все должны знать об этих страшных репрессиях, об этом геноциде собственного народа, который происходил в наше время. И особенно молодое поколение. В других странах люди каялись. Я очень сожалею, что у нас такого покаяния не было. Самое неприятное и самое обидное, что много людей, которые стараются забыть и не бередить раны, а бередить все-таки надо. То, что пережила страна, то, что пережили люди, то, что пережили семьи, нету, нету оправдания никакого. Люди, которые оправдывают это, они не имеют права на оправдание. Yes, there we have it. Katya, Katya thank you so, so much uh, for this. 
uh, I just before I introduce um, Grigori, I want to say that I really related to what you said about the lack of images, because this piece that I just wrote that I mentioned, uh, Russia's Lost War for the Wilson Quarterly, I wrote about the veterans, severely disabled veterans of World War II, and the story that I think a lot of people in Russia know how they suddenly disappeared, were swept off the streets of Russian Soviet cities in the late 40s, 1950s, and then just wiped of collective out of collective memory and the issue there is too that there were millions of them and there are no pictures it's really very tragic it's very hard to to i agree with you that it's very hard to um to work with that memory when you have nothing visual to anchor it around um, i'll also mention for people who are not uh, familiar with with the family of plisetsky's that azari azari plisetsky that uh, who speaks in the documentary that katya showed is the brother of the very famous legendary ballerina Maya Plisetska. Okay, so we're going to um, now go to Grigory Baipan and let me introduce him. And before I do, um, I'd like to remind you that if you have questions for our guests, please submit them via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending your questions. Uh, Grigory Vaipan is a lawyer for victims of Soviet era repressions who has represented them before the Constitutional Court of Russia. Among his team's victories at the Constitutional Court is the well-known case of Eldar Dadin, a human rights activist who was imprisoned for peaceful protest. Until recently, Grigory was the head of litigation at the Institute of Law and Public Policy and independent NGO in Moscow. He is the laureate of prestigious awards. And last but not least, he's a former Galina Starobojtova Fellow on Human Rights and Conflict Resolution here at the Canon Institute. Grigori, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here at this event uh, on this important occasion. Um, I will have two parts to my presentation. First, I wanna speak about uh, a case of mine, a legal case uh, before the Russian Constitutional Court called uh, the right to return home case. Um, and second, uh, I wanna speak more broadly about uh, uh, why and how our generation, my generation is getting uh, increasingly involved uh, in this kind of work related to Soviet repressions and the Soviet past. Uh, so first I'll tell you a bit about my case and it's still ongoing. Um, so for the past uh, seven years, I've been doing a strategic uh, human rights litigation before uh, Russia's Constitutional Court and the European Court of Human Rights uh, at the Institute uh, of uh, Law and Public Policy, an NGO uh, where I used to work until recently. Uh, and so uh, this all started uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, a woman walked into, into my office. Uh, uh, her name was Yelizaveta Mikhailova. She was 69. Uh, at the time, I'll show you her picture. I've got a few pictures here. Uh, and she told her story and that's uh, how it all began. So she said that uh, she was a, a, a daughter of uh, a Soviet uh, man, Simon Mikhailov, who was uh, sent to a, uh, to a labor camp to Gulag in 1937. In 1946, he was released. He served eight years, an eight year sentence. Uh, and uh, he was banished. He couldn't return to a place he used to live. Uh, he used to live with his family in Moscow, in the Moscow suburbs. And he could no longer return. And that was a standard practice at the time. So people who served their criminal sentences in the Gulag were banished from um, all major cities, including Moscow and the Moscow region. He had nowhere, basic, basically nowhere to return. He had to relocate to his uh, wife's parents in Moldova, near Kishinev. And his wife had to leave Moscow. His wife uh, uh, was waiting for him in Moscow. He couldn't, he couldn't live without him and he was discriminated at work. So in 1947, he left. He took her, uh, elderly, uh, her elder daughter with her. She left Moscow, she relocated to reunite with her husband uh, in Moldova. And that's where Elizaveta Mikhailova, you see at the picture, that's where she was born in 1948. Once she was one, her father was rearrested again and was sent again to Siberia for 25 more years. He served five years. In 1954, he was released 
after Stalin's death, they started releasing people. He was released in 1954. Um, he was, uh, his, his first criminal case, his first criminal conviction was uh, uh, reconsidered. His criminal case was closed in 1956, but only the first case, not the second. So uh, until his death in 1974, he was a convict um, and he was basically an enemy of the people and he couldn't return to Moscow. So he died in exile. Yelizaveta Mikhailova is still living in exile. How could that happen? So we started looking into this story more closely and we found out that today in 2020, well, back then 2017, uh, as much as several thousand people, uh, children of the Gulag, as we call them, children of those who were persecuted, are still living in exile. Their families were once deported from places they used to live, uh, and uh, they had nowhere to return. Uh, they, they still live in, in places, uh, in remote places in Siberia. Uh, uh, they, they live in the far north of the country. In 1991, uh, there, there was a law on uh, there, there was a, that law on rehabilitation for victims of uh, political repressions that was adopted, uh, that provided for a number of remedies. One of the remedies was a right to return home. Uh, and that right, importantly and crucially, included the right to get social housing from the government to compensate for the homes that their families lost uh, in the Soviet times. Uh, but that law proved to be, uh, uh, that right to return home proved over the recent years, proved to be an illusory right, proved to be a right that, that uh, exists on paper, but no one can really enjoy it. Uh, it, it all, it, you know, the history of this law and the history of this right is, is in, in, in many respects, a history of the government's attitude towards, uh, towards the victims of the Soviet repressions. Over the years, the law was amended gradually uh, so that it lost its thrust. With regard to this right to return home, in 2005, uh, the federal government uh, reallocated the financial burden to the regions and, and it, it kind of shifted all the obligations, the housing obligations uh, from the federal level to the regional level. And uh, that basically left nothing of that right because uh, all the regions uh, began introducing very burdensome, sometimes outright absurd, regulations, uh, certain legal preconditions and requirements that made it impossible for, for the victims to qualify for that housing and as a result to, uh, to return. So uh, to give you just one example, in, in Moscow, uh, a place uh, where most people were, were banished from in the Soviet times, in Moscow, uh, they said that the authorities said that uh, in order to get housing, the victims of, uh, of the Gulag had to first in order to return they they had first to live to return and live in the city for at least 10 years and own no housing of their own so that that it was a vicious circle so in order to return you had to return first and live for 10 years um, no one no one knew where uh, so we started working on that case as we were working on the case uh, we uh, realized that it was a case for the constitutional court because it was there was a, an issue with the law. The law was broken and we had to fix it. Uh, so it became not only a case about Yelizaveta Mikhailov and her individual fate and the fate of her family, but it also became uh, a case for all the children of the Gulag. So um, in 2019, we finally reached the constitutional court uh, with Yelizaveta Mikhailov and we were also representing two other victims, Evgenia Shashova pictured here on the left from, she now lives in the Republic of Komi in the north, and Alisa, Alisa Meissner, uh, pictured here in the center, who lives in the Kirov region. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, she's, uh, she's a daughter of a uh, German woman who was deported from Moscow in 1941 as part of uh, the collective deportation of Germans uh, during World, World War II. So in 2009, so as we were doing this case, everyone was saying it was impossible to win this case. It would be impossible to, uh, uh, to get uh, a, a, a favorable uh, ruling from the constitutional court. Uh, and uh, statistically only, uh, uh, only, only, one, only 0.5% of all cases of all applications uh, uh, that go to the constitutional court uh, and uh, 
with a positive ruling. But nonetheless, the Constitutional Court ruled uh, in favor of, of these three applicants, and it said that the law must be immediately amended. Now, uh, 10 months into the, and uh, you see here Alisa Meissner making, uh, making her statement uh, uh, before the court. Um, and here we are, all three applicants uh, and myself uh, at the court. So now 10 months uh, after the judgment, it has not been implemented yet. And uh, it's a very complicated process. And the government has introduced a draft law that basically is a sabotage of the ruling of the Constitutional Court. Uh, it leaves uh, the existing legal regulation almost intact. Uh, the people would will now, the victims will now only be allowed uh, to be placed on a general housing wait list with an average waiting time of 25 to 30 years. So you can imagine these people will never, if the law is adopted as the government now proposes, then th these people will never actually be able to return. And um, uh, we, uh, are now in this, uh, we are now uh, in the midst of a, of a campaign and we are advocating for the, for the proper and full implementation of the Constitutional Court's judgment. And uh, this process uh, perhaps to some extent has become more important than the desired result because the victims have, have really got a voice. Uh, and uh, you, you see, even, even at the Constitutional Court, they were given a stand and uh, for many years, no one even knew their story. No one, and even today, most people still don't know that there are survivors of the Gulag who still live in exile. So we were able to mobilize a lot of support. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a petition at the change.org uh, where we uh, ask, even invite people to sign uh, and to demand that the Russian parliament fully implement the judgment of the constitutional court. And so far, we uh, have been able to gather more than 66,000 uh, signatures under that petition, and uh, the process is still ongoing. But uh, I want to tell, I want to mm, uh, conclude, and that's the second part of my talk, I want to say uh, a bit ab about the broader context. Uh, uh, because uh, as we, as I was working on this case for the past three and a half years, I I, I realize that I am surrounded by people, by mostly by people of my generation. So I am 30 right now. Uh, there's another lawyer uh, at the Human Rights Center Memorial working on this. She's 30, 30, 32. Uh, there's a there's a local member of uh, parliament in Moscow advocating. Uh, working as part of this campaign, he's 34. And uh, just recently I was contacted by uh, two journalists interested in telling the stories of, of um, the children of the Gulag, telling about this case. They're both 20 years old. So I think it's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, today uh, in 2020, there's this, there's this increasing interest by people of our generation, people in 20s and 30s, in their 20s and 30s, an interest in this topic. Um, and I, uh, I can explain why I am doing this. I, well, why, why and how I got involved in this. Uh, and I think there's a, gener there's a civic aspect to it and a, and a professional aspect to it. A civic aspect, I think, is that uh, uh, we as young people in Russia today see the parallels between uh, uh, the Soviet past, especially 1930s, uh, and uh, our present. So uh, many policies of our government uh, remind us of, of the repressions of the Soviet past. In fact, they look as the continuation of, of, of the repressive policies of the Soviet government. So in this respect, it becomes for me, and I think for, for, for my friends and colleagues, it becomes a matter of you know, civic dignity to do this kind of work. So when we participate, when we work for the victims of the Gulag, when we advocate for the right to return home, we uh, also show, we not only show that there are people that, that still need our protection, there are still survivors that need legal help, but we also demonstrate this link between the past and the present. So that's the civic aspect and the professional aspect. Uh, I think there's, um, it, uh, so if you look at the, at the legal, at the landscape of the legal profession in Russia today, you will see an increase in public interest lawyering. And this case is an example of, is, it's as a traditional, just as a transitional justice case, it's an example of, uh, public interest lawyering. And uh, despite the effort of the government, 
to really discourage uh, young people to go into the civil society sector uh, and the work as uh, human rights lawyers to start their NGOs. There's an increasing interest in, in, in that area. So we are moving, the legal profession is moving from, from a purely private uh, commercial legal work, increasingly moving to human rights and public interest work. So. Uh, there's a sad part of the story that, you know, uh, 70, 80 years after the repressions, people, are, the survivors are still living in exile. They have not been compensated. But uh, nonetheless, there's a positive aspect to this story in that we see the new generation uh, taking up these uh, issues, taking up these cases, uh, and uh, really, um, uh, really pushing this agenda forward. So uh, this makes me uh, feel optimistic uh, about our present and possibly even our future. All right, thank you. Well, I, I, I forgot to tell that uh, I, 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 I should perhaps that uh, there's a link to the, uh, uh, to the petition that I was uh, uh, talking about. So it's in Russian but it says adopt a law that would finally bring children of the gulag back home. So if you want to join, feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grigori. Um, I'm going to introduce Nikolai in a moment. Just give me one second. Um, and before I do, I'd like to remind you uh, that if you have questions for our guests, please submit them via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute or on our Facebook page. Um, Nikolai Epley is an independent researcher working on international memorial culture and on memory of Soviet state terror. He is the author of The Inconvenient Past, Memory of the State Crimes in Russia and Other Countries. He has published extensively on historical memory issues and vedomosti in Liberty, Kolta, and other Russian media. He has lectured on ancient Greek philosophy, classical medieval literature, and published translations from Greek, Latin, English, German, and Italian. He is a holder of prestigious fellowships. Nikolai, the floor is yours. Nikolai, please un unmute yourself. Nikolai. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you, Isabella, for the introduction and for the invitation. And uh, I just first want, want to tell that, that uh, I watch with interest um, the case which uh, Grigori and his team is involved because it's a part of my personal uh, story also, of my, my, my family story, because my grandfather and his brother, they was of German origin, and they were deported from Moscow to Siberia, to Kazakhstan and to Siberia, and my grandfather uh, was killed there, and his brother and his family uh, lived uh, the, 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 the large part of their life in, in, in uh, Sverdlovsk, and now the, their, their children uh, they was banished from the possibility to to come back to to Moscow because of this of this um, uh, situation that that Grigory described, and now 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 they live they they live in in New York. Um, so yes, uh, I should provide uh, us with with I was invited uh, to to provide us with with an academic uh, context, but I bet I. I'm, I'm, it's, it's better for me to provide with, with international context because my book is uh, dedicated to the uh, discussion that um, the, 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 the memory, the, the difficult memory uh, as an international phenomenon uh, and uh, speaking internationally. Of course, uh, uh, we uh, should speak here about the third generation phenomenon. Uh, and it's not necessarily the, the third, fourth and fifth and sixth, uh, but it is uh, a consensus about the scholars that, that uh, mm, when we speak about, about uh, uh, national tragedies, about, about uh, uh, genocides and uh, dictatorship, dictatorship, mass violence, 
uh, case uh, three, the uh, third generation is always more free than the second on the, the generations of victims th themselves. And uh, it is uh, the third generation, uh, which normally uh, can mm, be the actors of the really dramatic moves and changes in the work with, uh, with uh, memory of this uh, mass violence. Uh, the, the most uh, famous phenomenon, of course, is, is a, a generation of uh, 1968 in Germany, uh, which was politically active in, 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 in these years. And uh, this third generation uh, was the subject of this dramatic change uh, in German uh, working through the past about, about, about Nazi, Nazi crimes. Uh, the same student, uh, student uh, protests of uh, late 60s uh, was important in uh, France uh, because it was the same dramatic change in the dealing with, with uh, uh, memory about Vichy, regime. Uh, in uh, 2017 in Spain, uh, it was the first case of the state-sponsored uh, burial of uh, the relics of the victim uh, of uh, civil war. Uh, Ascension Mendieta, the daughter of this, this man who was killed in the 30s, uh, uh, she had possibility to, uh, he, was, he was buried in mass, in mass grave. And after several decades uh, uh, of, of uh, juridical fights with, 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 with the state, uh, she could bury his relics uh, in Madrid, and it was the burial sponsored by, 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 by the state. But the active person here was not this daughter of the victim, but her daughter, the third generation. Uh, the same we see, for example, in Argentina, where uh, the, the second wave of trials uh, of, of uh, leaders of junta in Argentina, uh, which was the junta was was ended in in, in 1982, but uh, the uh, second and really serious wave of of trials uh, be began just in 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 the first decade of of uh, 21st century. And it, it began because of the pressure of the society. And it was uh, not the children's of, not other children of, of the victims, but their grandchildren. Uh, so we see that third generation is always, uh, they're more free from limitations, uh, which are normal for the victim themselves and for, 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 for the, their children. Uh, they they are not afraid of the state so much. Uh, they uh, can uh, deal with 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 these uh, issues with in in another in another way. Maybe not so emotional. Uh, maybe uh, it's not so so much personal memory, but kind of cultural memory. Uh, it is also a phenomenon of, of cosmopolitization of, of memory. For example, uh, uh, the movie, uh, which was very important for the change of mind of uh, French, French society, uh, documentary, The Sorrow and the Pity by the Marcel of Fulfus, uh, made in, in 1969. Uh, it was kind of 
na national phenomenon in, in France. But uh, about 10 years later, uh, it was uh, uh, mentioned, it was a kind of personage of uh, Woody Allen's uh, movie, Any Hole. So Woody Allen made this film a uh, kind of intellectual fashion uh, for heroes of, of uh, this film and for generation of, of Americans who was watching this film. Uh, it was uh, a new language uh, which of, of discussion the past. Uh, it, can be, it can be a kind of fashion, which was not possible, of course, for the uh, French society in, in 60s. Uh, so uh, the third generation is, is, is really an issue here. And it's when, when we're speaking about, about uh, Russia, uh, here it is not uh, the third generation, literally, which 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 we 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 we, we, which we uh, represent and which uh, we see the the re which represent the the, the uh, new wave of interest to the uh, history of of Gulag. We really see the uh, new wave of interest, and I think. Uh, the 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 um, chronological chronological point when this interest increase uh, is uh, uh, twenty thirteen and twenty fourteen because of the after because of the Crimea crisis uh, state began to use the language uh, of uh, appealing to, to this Stalin and Stalinism. Uh, it uses uh, words like, like uh, national traitors. Uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, it, the, 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 there were several movies about uh, heroic uh, 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 Stalin of officials. Uh, and uh, this uh, state-sponsored narratives uh, caused a counter reaction in society. And we really see that uh, in, in 2014 and later, uh, there are uh, increasing wave of publications uh, which uh, uh, are in contrast with this uh, Stalinist discourse, with this Stalinist narrative. Uh, and uh, when we're speaking about uh, uh, Russia, I, I'd like to uh, uh, say that uh, we should uh, we should use more 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 uh, more complex construction. That, for example, that what which which we see in the in the uh, text of uh, announcement of uh, our uh, discussion today. Uh, there are no uh, such, uh, this, this, this picture is more complex than uh, the bad uh, Stalinist Kremlin and uh, anti-Stalinist civil society. It is more complex. Uh, mm, the state is a, a complicated uh, actor. Uh, plural actor, and uh, mm, uh, for example, uh, I told that that uh, this uh, uh, case, uh, which which Grigory is involved, is my my the case of of, of my family also, and uh, mm, 
uh, several days ago, it was the first demonstration of the movie, animate, animated movie, uh, which uh, was made by my children about their grand grandfathers. Uh, this movie uh, was made by the team of, of uh, so my children were drawing it and uh, the team of uh, professional animators, animate, animation uh, painters helped them. We met with this team of uh, animators uh, uh, when I traveled to Karelia when it was first trial uh, of uh, Yuri Dmitriev. And uh, this team of professional animators, uh, it is a group uh, which coordinates support of Yuri Dmitriev. So we just met, met because, of, because of Dmitriev. And we decided to make this, this, this movie. And uh, this movie was demonstrated in a uh, state museum of uh, Gulag history. And uh, the State Museum of Gulag History uh, published uh, late books of Yuri Dmitriev. So we see, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, we really know that that uh, the state politics of of dealing with with past uh, is uh, more and more. How to say black and white in this in this way, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we see that some state-sponsored uh, activities uh, are still active, and the museum is more active than than in last in previous decade, and there are very interesting projects uh, which which are also state-sponsored. Uh, so it is a complex uh, picture, and uh, the, the the last uh, thing is uh, in 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 this text uh, it is mentioned the 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 survey the uh, opinion polls um, according to which uh, there were a decrease of the notion about about um, uh, Stalin's uh, repressions. But uh, the public opinion polls is not a good instrument to measure such complicated uh, things. In this concrete case, uh, it is a quite interesting picture. When we ask uh, people, uh, do you know something about uh, Stalin's purges, Stalin's repressions? Uh, they mostly say yes. When we asked uh, people, do you know something about political terror of 30s or political terrors, uh, terror of, of the years from 30s to 50s. They mostly, mostly uh, say we're not sure. So this uh, public opinion polls, they measure not, not the real, uh, the real uh, uh, understanding of the, of, of the issue, but the uh, reception of some some uh, phrases and and narratives, and it's 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 really very difficult to measure what what new new generation know and which do we do 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 we are uh, uh, watching uh, some 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 changes here, but. Uh, as I mentioned about the third generation phenomenon, this new generation, uh, because of the new wave of interest, they're more free. They can deal with it as with, as with cultural phenomenon, not so emotional maybe for, as, as, as for their fathers and grand, grandfathers and grandmothers. So, this uh, we we really see the the increase of interest. Uh, we see the new uh, films, animation films, 
uh, media phenomenon as as uh, Yuri Dudes uh, uh, YouTube uh, movie uh, about K Kalima, which has dramatically, I think, twenty millions of of uh, let's see uh, views. Uh, so uh, now this interest to to the the Soviet state terror is definitely uh, more wide than it was it was in previous gen generation. It knows it not it, it is not concentrated anymore among among uh, historians, specialists, and and relatives. So now this interest is broader, and uh, it is open for other groups of, of society, not professionally or uh, personally related to this history. And so here I'm also optimistic about, about uh, this, the future of, of this discussion. Thank you. Nikolai, thank you very much. Uh, so let's, uh, we have quite a number of questions from the audience, but I actually um, want to ask, uh, let's see, Katya hopefully will rejoin us very soon because I wanted to ask her a question. But Nikolai, why don't I ask uh, you, since you were uh, just speaking, when I was reading your book, which is truly excellent, um, you mentioned there something that I found very interesting. Um, you mentioned that we are kind of in Russia at a point of, um, of a memory breakthrough, I think is what you call it, that it's, it's a point when uh, the understanding of, or the knowledge perhaps is um, so diffuse and so it's, it's so widespread in fact, contrary to what we sometimes think that it could produce real change. Did I understand you correctly? Could you comment on that? Yes, yes. And, and uh, I think it's maybe a maybe, maybe good, good example that uh, this, the case of, of Yuri Dmitriev, yes, uh, it is a historian uh, uh, um, uh, who was uh, searching for the places of uh, mass graves. And he founded uh, several places of uh, mass graves where uh, a thousand of uh, victims of uh, Soviet state terror in the 30s were killed and buried. And uh, he found these this places uh, in late uh, 90s. Uh, and in uh, and these these places were uh, familiar for for uh, those who was professionally interested in this, for uh, um, historians or or for for relatives. But uh, in uh, uh, 2016, he was arrested at, at the first time. Uh, uh, his 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 case. Uh, adversely was falsified. And uh, it is a huge wave of support uh, of Yuri Dmitriev in Russia. And uh, as a result of this support and this new interest, he's, he's still under arrest. Now it's the third trial. Uh, and because of this, of this interest, uh, I think in, in its geometrical uh, progression, yes, of of of, audi of audience increase. So now uh, the Sandarmoch, the name of this this uh, mass grave, which was founded by by Dmitriev, is known for, I think, all every, every, everyone in 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 Russia. So. Uh, it is a dramatic uh, uh, increase of, of, of interest. So in, 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 the, in, in, in late 90s, in, 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 in 20s, uh, 
I think the first wave of interest uh, was it was kind of psychological uh, um, how to say uh, it was um, Uh, it was not possible to make this 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 uh, information more public than 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 it was made. Uh, but uh, now this these cases, this new new uh, wave of state um, violence, which Gregory uh, mentioned, uh, make this uh, issue uh, not of historical interest. It, it 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 is feeling it people feel not, that it is something something uh something really relevant to 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 everyone so it's not it's not a history uh, it's not about history it's it's it's, it's about present Thank you very much, Nikolai. And Katya, welcome back. I'm glad you were able to rejoin us. So I want to ask you um, a couple of things. There are actually a couple of questions for you uh, from the audience, but I also, I'll start by asking, um, first of all, could you say once again, how, how can people view the Generation Gulag videos? Uh, somebody in the audience asked they couldn't, uh, they, let, let's give more specific directions for people. And I wanted to ask you, what, uh, what has been the reaction to this series? First of all, the, the artists that you worked with, you said they were all young people. Was it, what kind of a project was it for them? What did they learn? What did you hear from them? And then did you hear from your, from audience? What, what, have been, what has been the feedback to the series, especially from younger audiences? Sure. So I hope you can hear me. I'm having some internet issues, but I, I'm joining from mobile. Um, so I hope the audio is still the same, the same quality. It sounds um, very good. Great. Uh, so in terms of, in terms of the experience, I mean, working with this younger group, with this younger creative team, you know, it ended up being just such a, a part of what we took away from the project. Um, you know, like I said, most were under 30 or even under 25 and, they would come back to me with, with stories of how while working on this project, they would then go and talk to their family members and start asking questions for the first time um, about their own family history, which hadn't really, you know, it just hadn't occurred to them because it's not something that's in um, that's this kind of topic that's in, or in discussion. And, and many of them were finding out, you know, these family secrets, which, you know, weren't really necessarily even being held out, out of fear anymore, but it just was out of practice to talk about these things and were telling me, you know, what I just found out about my grandfather today or about my great uncle. And I think, um, and, and that was incredible. It happened with me, with um, my own family as well. Um, I was hearing stories for the first time and I, I'm constantly asking uh, my relatives about my family history, but for some reason it was only now that uh, some of these stories came out. So, so that kind of reaction from the younger team we had, that was really interesting. Um, in, terms, in terms of the public reaction, I mean, I, I was really just overwhelmed with the amount of comments we got across um, across social media where we posted the, oh, so the, the series, it's available on Coda Story's website at codastory.com, or if you search Generation Gulag, um, that it should show up. Um, so in the comments to where we posted the series across our social media sites, I, I was seeing, you know, posts that are just paragraphs and paragraphs. And uh, this, I really felt this kind of, that there was this urge for people to start, um, to have it said out loud, to have it on the record, to have it in a Facebook comment. Um, there was this, you know, this outpouring of stories. I even in this has been, we released the series in January and I'm still getting emails uh, or new comments every few weeks, um, which I, I think is incredible. I think there really is this uh, feeling that, you know, there isn't a space for people to be sharing the story. Where, where do they come forward? Where do they post this? Where can they make it public? Um, so that was, you know, I'd love to find, well, we're not filming any more series yet, but we are trying to find a way to, to make those stories public that have come to us um, post-publication. 
So I, I think I answered those. Um, was there a third question? There, you had a couple. Um, well, yes, actually, there was a question. Let, let me let me circle to Grigori for now, and then I'll, okay. I'll circle back to you. Okay. So, so Grigori, I think the, there was a question. Um, uh, just to clarify, this is from Catherine Schuler, who is a professor at the Department of Women's Studies at the University of Maryland. She uh, she's just trying to clarify if the three plaintiffs won their case before the Constitutional Court, why would the state continue to impede their return? Is there is it political? Is it is there something? Is is it an attempt to silence them, or is it some kind of a legal issue, legal thickets that uh, that uh, that are impeding this? It's part of a legal slash political game. Uh, legally speaking, when there's a judgment by the constitutional court, it, uh, uh, it 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 becomes a matter for the government to introduce a draft law to change the law that was declared unconstitutional. And then it's up to the parliament to consider the draft law that's presented by the government, by the executive, and either adopt it or reject it or amend it. So we are now at this point where the draft law is before the parliament uh, and there's a, there's a discussion going on about, about this draft. And in fact, we, we, have, we have introduced our own draft, a counter draft, an alternative proposal to, to, the, to the government's proposal. So there's, there's now a, a, a competition between the two, the two drafts. And really the, the, the question is you know, whether there's a meaningful, as the court asked, asked to do, as the court ordered to do, whether there is a meaningful uh, and sufficiently funded legal uh, framework for people to get uh, uh, social housing in the, in the towns or cities where their families used to live as soon as possible. Uh, in, in our case, meaning within the span of one to three to five years, because we, we all understand, inclu everyone, including bureaucrats, understand that in 10 to 15 years from now, there will be no one uh, entitled uh, to, the, to this right anymore. So th there's an ongoing process right now. Thank you very much. Um, I want to address the question that Nikolai brought up absolutely uh, fairly. It's a fundamental thing to understand about the subject in Russia is that it is, uh, it's not really black and white because absolutely the state has established uh, a, a monument uh, for victims of political repressions. There is the Gulag Museum. Um, uh, but at the same time, there are things like for example, Memorial, which is really one of the, I would say, the central uh, organization that works on the best known organization that has with the longest history of working on, on advancing the memory of, uh, of the repressions. It's become a foreign agent, which really complicates their work, including their work with younger people. They, they've been doing a lot of work with, uh, with school children, having them research their family history to make it very personal as a way to address, to approach this, this complicated, massive, big story. Uh, it's become harder for them since they became, um, since they were named foreign agent. Um, there are the, you know, you have, for example, the initiative, the Last Address Initiative, uh, which one of our senior advisors, Sergei Parhomenko, runs, uh, which attempts to commemorate the last place where a victim of political repressions lived, because in most cases, we don't know where people died, right? We don't know, they have no uh, graves, there is no place where people can go and remember their loved ones. So the, it's, the initiative is to, okay, let's commemorate the, the last address where they live. Uh, so on the one hand, they work on it and it's okay. But on the other hand, once in a while, they will encounter resistance. And so, so the question for me is, first of all, have you maybe, Grigori, you especially because you are specifically operating in Russia because Katya, for example, is in, in, in Georgia and Nikolai, maybe in your work also, uh, but Grigori, because you're working within the justice system, I think it's, it's interesting for me. Have you noticed any, I don't know, any resistance? Have you been a target of perhaps any kind of negative action on the part of the state for what you're doing? Um, and what, what are some other examples where you see perhaps you know, what do we see happening in schools? How are children taught? Again, that kind of push-pull by the state. On the one hand, they teach something. On the other hand, they don't. What can we say about that? So any, uh, it's for uh, anybody can comment. Perhaps, Grigori, why don't you start? Uh, right. Uh, so, so first, I, I want to say I have not uh, met any active resistance while I've been working on this topic. But uh, generally, like I said in my initial talk, the government discourages 
um, uh, independent NGO work. And that means uh, if you run an independent NGO in Russia, it would be very difficult, first of all, to get funding because you have this alternative. Um, either you decline foreign or international funding or you accept it uh, from you know, donors independent from the government. And then you run the risk of being labeled a foreign agent with all the consequences that that, that, that has for publicity and the interaction with government agencies and officials. Um, uh, so, so generally, it's it's not easy to work on on this uh, in this area. Um, apart from this, uh, your question uh, is uh, I, it's an important question because it uh, uh, our case illustrates how it, even in in Russia's political uh, environment today, uh, there are creative ways to mobilize even official institutions on uh, such a controversial topic as uh, uh, memory of the Soviet past and compensation for victims of uh, Soviet repressions. Um, so uh, I fully agree with Nikolai on this. It's not black and white. Uh, it depends on, uh, on the ability of civil society actors to mobilize uh, government institutions by, by, you know, it depends on how smart your rhetoric is. We, over the past sev several months, been able to mobilize, uh, I hope they take no offense, such sleeping institutions as the Civic Chamber of the Russian Federation, for example, um, or uh, the President's Commission for Rehabilitation of the Victims of Political Repression. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of argument, it's a matter of rhetoric, um, and uh, it's interesting to see that we, we are now unlocking opportunities that I, I couldn't have anticipated several years ago. Um, uh, and so, for example, right now, right now, right as we speak, there's an ongoing process of collecting signatures under a collective petition by Moscow's local deputies. So right now we have more than 100 local members of local councils across Moscow signing a, a petition uh, addressed to the, to the Russian parliament demanding that uh, uh, the, the parliament adopts uh, a law that would fully implement the constitutional court's judgment. So again, from abroad, it looks like it's a monolithic state apparatus. When you're inside of it, you see there are lots of, in fact, sometimes hidden avenues. So in Moscow, there's, there's, this, um, there's this level of local parliaments where there's pretty strong representation by independent deputies. So that you can, you know, within a span of three to four days, you can really, you can really mobilize 100 people supporting you as local deputies, as local representatives. So that's, it's interesting. For me, it's actually my first, um, not purely legal, but a full, fully fledged human rights campaign. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really thrilled to see uh, how many people are into it, are into this. Thank you. Nikolai, do you want to add something? Yes, uh, just, just several words. I, I, I agree with, with, with Gregory. Uh, describing our, our state slash uh, society construction, yes, it is, and um, there are uh, inheritance of, of decades of state terror, uh, it is that, that uh, society and, and, and people in, gen in general, they feel uh, signals very much. They are sensitive to the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, uh, the state, uh, generally, uh, it, uh, it, it, it can be, it can tolerate uh, uh, with 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 uh, other with with activities in this in this field, but the actors should be controlled, should not be independent. What is the problem with with memorial? It is independent actor, so it should be banished from its activity by 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 the labeled foreign agent which uh, because of which it is constrained uh, in communication with with state organization in, in around the Russia. Uh, uh, Yuri Dmitriev uh, is he was very very independent as an actor uh, so the state doesn't want 
to 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 have uh, independent actors on this field. Uh, but uh, describing this this as a as a as a as a frame, yes. Inside this frame, there is a kind of a number of, of very interesting variations. And as Gregory uh, told, we're we are in very in very interesting point uh, now. And uh, 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 the the authorities understand that uh, this 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 issue is is sensitive and uh, they are trying to to balance uh, to balance the situation when uh, when we see two uh, uh, stalinist uh, uh, statements from some uh, politics uh, the state uh, is trying to counterbalance it with some anti-Stalinist uh, statements. Uh, yes, and for example, uh, the, the, we have we have very quite good uh, school history books uh, about about this this period, but uh, uh, teachers in uh, in today's Russia are very dependent from the state, and you know uh, schools are normally polling places uh, during during the votes so they involved in 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 politics uh, so we have good textbooks but uh, teachers are very sensitive sensitive to the atmosphere so they can teach about repressions but they can be afraid to feel free in this in in in, in this uh, field so Thank you very much. Katya, I want to ask you, um, we have a question from, um, from Amit Pandia, I hope I'm pronouncing um, the name correctly, attorney at law. He's, he's referencing Nazi Germany, which left a copious record of film and photos of its atrocities. And he's asking, what does the failure of the Soviet regime to do so tell us about its recognition that its behavior violated norms and that, it's, uh, that it, it was a shameful behavior? And my question is, is it that is what is your sense? Is it that there are no images, there's no film and no photos, or is it that they're simply locked away in the archives somewhere? Mm -hmm. No, I, I believe I think there are absolutely those photos, that video footage, uh, the paperwork is there. Uh, I'm sure by no means as meticulous as the documentation that was kept by the Germans, um, but I, I think it's there. But um, and, and we do, you know, part of the reason we know that is because, you know, I went to the Georgian Film Archives and I was able to find some footage. Um, people in Latvia, um, what was it, just last year when they, um, when the government officially declassified those thousands of documents and published the names of people who were informants, um, and many of these people were still alive, were, were public figures or family members, and it caused this huge scandal. All those names were were existed. They were on paper, um, but then again, we we also do hear. I think Memorial has uh, been publishing that the the Russian government has also been destroying some records selectively, and they'll say that you know we're digitizing the records, but then it's not clear where where are they. Um, so obviously, it's still a question mark, but. Uh, there's more that whatever we're seeing now has to be just this tiny tip of an iceberg, right? Um. Thank you very much. So I want to ask um, a question that I think uh, it's, it's fairly broad and it's the issue that I think makes the situation uh, for Russia uh, quite unique or maybe not. Nikolai, you tell me because you've studied how internationally people deal with memory of, of mass atrocities. The fact that so often within the same family, right? It's not just the victims. There were so many people who participated on the part of the state in the atrocities, who perpetrated the atrocities. And so often you have within the same family, Nikolai, you write about it in your book, you have both victims and perpetrators. And it's something that makes the issue of dealing with this memory so, so difficult and so, so painful and so in many ways divisive. So I, I wonder if you can um, 
if you can maybe comment on this fact, how do you, it seems that it's necessary to breach it because there's always a big group of people who are maybe descendants of, the, of those who worked in the Gulag system, for example, who resist commemorative uh, aspects or maybe who fear that there will be sort of this mass requirement for mass repentance and they fear that. So um, how do we bridge this situation? Um, how do we achieve justice uh, for those who are still alive uh, without, with, with maximum support from the broader society uh, so that this, this, this complicating factor doesn't get in the way. Who would like to start? I'm trying to, 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 to be brief here. Yes, it's a kind of uniqueness of, 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 of Russia. It's not the Russia alone in this, Situation, but but it's 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 a quite a unique feature, and we see that uh, this this element of of our memory model is usually uh, used uh, for manipulations. So uh, we 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 often hear that it's uh, dangerous to 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 speak about this because it can re revive. Uh, 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 an opposition uh, between between the the uh, children of of uh, perpetrators perpetrators and children of of, of victims, uh, and uh, when Memorial published a list of NKVD uh, officials several years ago, it was an article that that uh, children of 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 them wrote. A Letter to President Putin uh, asking to banish this 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 list, and uh, it was turned out that this uh, letter was a fake. So it is a good reason for for uh, manipulation, and uh, it is a good answer that that there is there is a, a, a narrative of of guilt, which is which is uh, which is uh, irrelevant irrelevant here. And it is a narrative of responsibility. Uh, and I think uh, here uh, German experience is very, very important for us. And I hope that uh, now the, the, the uh, very important book of Karl Jaspers, uh, the Schuldfrage, where he, where he uh, uh, just, uh, uh, speaks about the difference of, of guilt and responsibility will be published in Russian again, because it's very important conversation for Russia now. Grigory, do you want to, would you like to comment on this question? Well, very briefly, it, it, it's become almost a common saying that there's no peace without justice. So for those people who want to push uh, the issue of the Soviet past to the margins, because it would somehow uh, impede uh, the, the kind of the peace process. Well, we're not in the, in the post-Civil War context, but uh, people who want to keep it silent, uh, Nikolai has, has said many times that uh, it doesn't mean that the issue will disappear. It would just uh, uh, move to the level of subconscious and would, uh, uh, it, it, it would ultimately uh, prevent us as a society, as a country from from going forward. Um, my involvement in, 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 this, uh, uh, in this theme uh, has been uh, on the issue of compensation. So the right to return home is, a, is an aspect of uh, compensational reparation, uh, which would be a legally correct way to describe this. Um, and uh, so it, it makes, in, in, my, in, in my view, it makes it even, even, even more uh, up to date, uh, so to say, for 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 us as uh, as people living in Russia, because it's not only a matter of the past; it's something that we we are uh, we are having in front of our eyes right now. We have uh, people who have survivors that are still living around us and that uh, have have not received the justice that they deserve. Thank you very much. And we have just five minutes left. And I wanted to uh, finish with a question that came from a member of our audience, Jeremy Cohen from the Caspian Policy Center. Um, and perhaps Katya, we start with you. Um, the, the question is, 
what lessons from the process of documenting the Holocaust and transmitting the stories of survivors can be applied to maintaining stories of the Gulag and the collective memory? Uh, and I wonder if you use that at all, uh, because the, the Holocaust studies are very much grounded in telling the stories of individual uh, survivors and even on the kind of grassroots level memory in, in synagogues and in various events around commemoration, there is a, there is a, um, uh, a tradition to bring uh, a survivor because there is a sense that to hear directly from a person who survived is really much more powerful than just to hear a, an abstract lecture. So I wonder if you use that, that example and I'd love to hear from others if others um, have, have applied to this example, uh, this example of the Holocaust. And just to tell you, we have to be brief, we, ha we have four minutes left. Sure, so I mean, the, what you said right now is I, I think what's key to the strategy is, is having witnesses, having eyewitnesses. Um, there's a reason we didn't make a 45 minute film with five different characters. We wanted each person to have their own, you know, a chance to have their own distinct story out there for a viewer to, you know, while they're watching the film to start to have a relationship with this person. Um, and then kind of the, the second point I want to make in terms of lessons, um, lessons from the Holocaust is that, you know, most, almost every Holocaust museum, they, they'll have a um, education center um, and part of their work will be um, genocide prevention as well. It's very much, um, again, it's not uh, so much a history museum as it is this living museum with a big focus on, on the present and there are at least the Holocaust Museum in Washington will always have rotating exhibits about um, genocide around the world and human rights violations around the world. And I, I think that's something that really needs to carry over to, to the way we talk about the Soviet repressions and the way we memorialize them. The Gulag Museum in Moscow, it does have an education center. It does provide teachers with education plans, which is great. Um, but obviously they're not you know, making these profound connections to the present. Um, they're not trying to draw parallels. And I understand that that's difficult. It, it does feel a bit ridiculous. It is ridiculous to compare the repressions today to the 1930s, but it's not so much to compare today's repressions to the 1970s or the 1980s. There are very legitimate you know, um, lessons that you, in parallels you can draw and that's, that's not happening. Um. But yeah, anybody else would like to? Nikolai, please. Yes, yes, as, as, it, 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 as Daniel Levy and Nathan Schneider in their book about cosmopolitization of, of Holocaust memory uh, uh, described that the, the memory of Holocaust uh, be, became a kind of frame that formed a, 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 a construction of, of memory about about mass uh, violence in, in in global scale and uh, in, in Russia also and as far as I know uh, Moscow State Museum of Gulag history was uh, uh, interested uh, they, they, they they communicated with with Holocaust Museum when they formed their their exposition and there are a lot of parallels reading names uh, which which memorial organize uh, today have uh, interest, interesting analogs with reading names in, in Jewish tradition, for example. So there, there are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, parallels here. And in fact, uh, tomorrow uh, there will be a, um, in commemoration of the victims of political repressions, there will be a traditional um, commemorative event in Moscow called the Return of the Names when it's the names today. of victims, oh, it's today. today. Yes. It's today, okay, I apologize. So, so uh, right, so there is the, the reading of the names of those who uh, were murdered in the repressions also it, as, a, as a bid to personalize uh, this event, to take it out of the realm of millions and to make it much more real for people. I'm afraid that this is all the time that we have. I want to thank you so, so much for this excellent, fascinating discussion. Obviously, we could have talked for many hours more, and it's not the last time we're doing it. We'll have, we'll continue this conversation. We'll continue to publish on the subject. And I thank you so, so much for all the work you're doing on this. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella.